Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is that of the Society Murders, Margaret and Paul Wales King. We are off to Australia, baby. Get your thongs on, let's go. Sin and Tonic! Feels eerily silent around here today. Like there's not construction, birds, children. There's nothing like going on. It's I feel like naked. Good job I'm not. So we are going to Melbourne, Victoria, Australia today. Home to millionaire socialites Margaret Wells King, 69, and Paul King, 75. The couple lived in like a million dollar home in a really rich area of Melbourne, which was called Armadale. And they moved in only the very best circles and they played bridge and things like that. I wonder if like, you know, in Australia and America, well, any other country. So here, if you're posh, you talk like this. There's a way that, you know, that's the typical posh English accent. It's like that, like a politician, darling, or Patsy from Absolutely Fabulous. So, yeah, like Joanna Lumley. Oh, like that is mm, posh. Posh. So in America, I've just suddenly thought it, like in America and Australia, is there a posh Australian accent? There's got to be, surely. Posh Australian, posh American. There's got to be that. I need examples of that in my life. I'm going to have to Google it. Darling. I might just start talking like that a little bit, just for fun. On Monday the 8th of April in 2002, the couple were reported missing by some of Margaret's children. It was quite apparent when they went to her property that day that she had not been there, the couple hadn't been there, since Thursday daytime. So four days prior to this. And they were wildly concerned because that was a long time. It was out of character for their mother and stepfather to, to not be in their home and to have not contacted anybody. Margaret, she was born in 1933, and she was born into high society. Her father had made a lot of money in road construction, and then her father and her mother went on to have another daughter called Diana. So the two sisters were brought up in this lavish lifestyle. I find it fascinating. Margaret and Diana became, in their own right, very well-known socialites. You know, they're from old, old money socialites. It's just, it's a different world. Margaret, she ended up in Melbourne and Diana ended up in Sydney. They enjoyed luxury lifestyles into their adulthood. They were the sort of people that had sun in the summer and snow in the winter. You know, like they went skiing and they had parties and lots of friends and mm, all of that jazz. When Margaret was 24, she married a man called Brian Wales. They A year later, they had their first daughter called Sally and then they had four more children after that. Damien, Emma, Prue, and then Matthew. The children all had private educations in expensive schools. They had lavish family holidays. They would go all over the place. The family had a lot of properties. You know, like the big wider family had lots of properties all over the place so that they could go there and visit those sorts of places. It was just, a uh, yeah. So, you know, it passed down the generations, this, this old money. Brian, Margaret's husband, he was a pilot, so he was away from home quite a lot. And in previous years, the couple had met somebody called Paul King. They had met on a holiday in the Brampton Islands. I don't know where that is. Or if I have said it correctly, Brampton Island or Brampton Islands. I'm not sure. So they had met this Paul King and he had become a family friend. He had also moved from Sydney to Melbourne. He had changed his job. He'd never married, so he was single. And he was now living in Melbourne. And I think from what I read, same old story. So she was lonely. Husband was working away all the time. Paul was there. They were close. Things became more than friends. You get the picture. They became lovers. Margaret and Brian would then eventually divorce and Margaret went on to then marry Paul. And this created a not pleasant atmosphere within her family with her children, her four older children. They massively blamed King Paul. King Paul. <laughs> you know, 
he's not King Paul. They blamed Paul, King, for their parents' separation and divorce. You know, you can see that. She was having an affair and the marriage ended, and that's really sad. So they weren't happy and they didn't like him and they just were like, you know, who are you? Ugh. They didn't think very highly of Paul either. Let me paint a picture for you. They would call Paul nicknames like the shadow or the butler and they would go on to say that Paul just in his early when they were first together he would dote on Margaret it sounds nice but actually it seemed like it was a lot more than that it sounds like Paul was her personal like assistant more than a husband he did everything for her and she was very controlling of people she was very manipulative and she had Paul under her spell, if you like. So not only were they miffed, to say the least, that he'd come and separated their parents, they also didn't think much of him as a person. They were like, oh, like a bit of a wet blanket. He was described as subservient to Margaret. Matthew, the youngest child, he was seven at the time when they married and he looked up to Paul. He saw Paul as more of a father figure than the others did. And this put a big wedge in between him and his four older siblings. Lots of other things occurred to make that wedge even bigger. But that was sort of the, the beginning of it, that he he didn't feel the same way that they did towards Paul. I mean, he was seven. He's, he was young. It would seem that Matthew was the golden boy. And there are lots of things in this case that make me feel believe that Margaret had many narcissistic traits she definitely seemed to have a golden child and that was Matthew she definitely was manipulative and controlling in her behaviors she would use money as a weapon she thought highly of herself and she definitely treated her children differently so Matthew the older siblings all of them had not not very nice things to say about Matthew that he was a prick of a child his siblings would say that their mother adored Matthew. They would call him golden boy. They believed that he was, because he was so handsome and their mother was so, another sort of narcissistic trait, you know, like keeping up appearances in the family. The, their mother was, you know, she just, she idolised him because he was just so handsome and so wonderful and he could do no wrong in her eyes however the older siblings could see that he was flawed in many ways and there were incidents where he would harm them he was unkind to them and also to animals red flag red flag horrific things with animals like you know ranging from just like pulling not just because it's still grim pulling their wings off of insects and things like that to decapitating small animals he had violent outbursts. He had a very low IQ. So even though he was handsome, he was not smart. And he was borderline, like bordering on having a, um, what is it when you, like, you, you know, when you're very, you've got a very low IQ. I can't think of the term that I need here. However, it's thought because of his privilege and the education that he had and how he was sort of brought up that it was not as obvious as it would have possibly been with another child that he was simple I, I can't think of the word that I need I can't think of it I apologize don't know what it is he had a low IQ despite that and despite the fact that he would hurt animals and that he was cruel to his siblings when presented with things that Matthew had done he would lie and his mother would just believe him and it was very frustrating for the older siblings who found his treatment to be really unfair his siblings said they were never close because of how his their mother treated him like he was on a pedestal so you know so much above them it's really damaging to children Matthew went on to go to hairdressing school and he qualified and then he opened a salon like a franchised hair salon he ran that and it seems like he was doing okay at that point in 1998 Matthew met Maritza they met in the salon and they they fell in love now Matthew had been engaged to another woman at the time and called off that engagement and that other woman was you know she had been given the okay by Mummy Dearest. 
she fit into the family well and mm, I don't know whether that had been arranged in any sort of way but she was accepted by the family as a good fit for Matthew and then when he called that off and then he declared his undying love for Maritza who was a woman older than him who had come over from Chile so she was different and exotic and she was older and not what they wanted in the family. Mm. Regardless, a year later, 1999, Matthew married Maritza and then they went on to have a child together, a baby boy, and they named him Dominic. And it seems like it's a kind of running theme. So, you know, I can understand them, the older siblings, having an issue with Matthew, especially if he was treated very differently to them. It's a shame. It wasn't Matthew's fault. It was his mother's fault. But yeah, it, it definitely divided them. And then when he met Maritza, they had quite strong opinions about her as well. So they, they didn't like her at all. They thought that she was a gold digger. They found her to be vulgar. They saw her as somebody that just wanted to be rich and that, that she was using Matthew for that. That was not helped at all by the fact that when a family property sold, I don't know how it works with all the whole old money thing, but I know they have loads of property, they have estates and they have trusts and they take money out of trusts and all sorts of stuff. They Don't they do that? Like, like they put money into a trust for their children's children and then when their children sort of get older, then they use that trust to live on and they can live in a property that the family own and all sorts of things like that. It's wild, wild. Anyhow, so a property was sold and it must have been written into an agreement or a trust that some of that money would would go to Matthew or probably all of the siblings. So he used his portion of that money to set up a shop for Maritza. So she wanted a fashion shop, clothes shop, and, you know, she wanted to have a go at that. And that was what she wanted to do. And Matthew was in love with her and they were married. So he used the money, he invested it, he bought a shop. And, you know, kitted it out, got the clothes. I was going to say got the fashion, got the fashion, got the fashion in. Did all of that and set up this, like, business for his wife. It was called Maritza Imports and it was on High Street in Melbourne. And neither of them had business savvy, I don't think, or they just wanted, she just wanted to have a go. And he had the means to allow her to give it a try. It didn't go very well. The family felt as if Maritza was just, you know, that's that was she wanted. That's what she'd wanted, just to play shop, but use the family's money. And also, when it wasn't going well, even though it wasn't going well, because neither of them sort of had any experience in something like that, they were just living out of their means. So they were just financially not in a very good position. The four older children. They were financially independent. Emma, Sally, Prue and Damien, they were all financially independent. They had gone on to get themselves good jobs themselves or married into other very wealthy families. So they were okay. They were sort of out of the financial claws of their mother if you like, because she was very controlling and dominant. And it sounds like even though some of the children didn't want to sort of speak ill of her later on, but they, it came, it became apparent that she would use money as a, as a manipulation. And if Matthew was having a difficult time financially, she would then be able to lord that over him and hold that over his head. You know, I'll help you if, or I imagine things like that. So she used it to her advantage, his financial turmoil. Then there was even more angst about money because Margaret and her sister Diana, Diana wanted to sell a unit, a property that they had, and the sale of that, it had been agreed that the profit would go to the siblings, the children. However, Margaret was not keen at that point to do that. She didn't want to do that. She wanted the money to go into a trust fund so that they would only be able to get that money when she died. I don't get that. Maybe she was really cross with them all, like because that's the sort of thing that would happen with a narcissistic mother, that she would be like, oh, you didn't come round for Sunday tea. You don't give me enough attention. No, 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 darlings, you're not getting your money. You can have that when, when I die. That sort of situation. It sounds like that was going on. So the four siblings were pissed. They were like, excuse me, 
we would like our money. I think they were doing all right, but you're never going to turn it down, are you? They thought they were going to get a share of this property. And she was trying to sort of go against that. She was mm, like, she was, she was saying, no, basically, I don't want you to have that money now. So she wanted the control over it. I read somewhere that Matthew found out that he was set to inherit the least out of this deal, this sale, and that that really angered him. Like he was so angry that he was not going to get the same as his siblings. And that does seem odd, doesn't it? Because he was the golden boy. But I'm not sure, maybe because he was the youngest and there was something to do with money like that, I don't know. And I don't know if that, I only read that in one source. However, he was also annoyed about the whole, like her trying to hold on to the money. He was also annoyed because she came to him, his mother, Margaret, with a document to sign saying that, and again, in two places, it, I read this differently, but basically she she believed that he, her youngest son, was the most pliable and the most likely to sign the document that would say that she agreed to what she wanted, basically, to sign it over. So he was really deeply hurt by that. He felt disrespected. He felt like he was the runt of the litter. That that was his words. I can see that. It feels very transactional, doesn't it? Like, you know, I do this for you and I've helped you. So you can sign this and you can do this for me. But really, you know, he, he wanted his share of the inheritance as well. And I think he felt used and mm, it just wasn't a good situation. They had a massive row, the whole family. And then in the early 2000s, things switcherooed around for Margaret and Paul. Now, he had been the butler and this situation changed dramatically because he had two strokes and it left him weak and unwell. And he also got the beginning, the start of dementia. So he wasn't well and he needed to be looked after. He could walk and he could talk, but he needed 24 hour care. He went to like a day centre care thing one day a week to offer respite to Margaret. But other than that, she was his main carer for 24 hours of the day, every other day of the week. And I'm I'm sure I couldn't find anything about it, but I'm sure if she is as narcissistic as I believe that she is, I'm sure she would have really hated that. When golden boy Matthew invited her and Paul for dinner on the 4th of April, Thursday night, she would have jumped at the chance because it was, you know, she, anything that would get her out of her house, something to different, something else to do. So that was what happened. They were invited on Thursday, the 4th of April, 2002. When the day came around, Margaret and Paul invited some friends over to their house in Armadale. And they had a glass of white wine and some snacks before they headed over to Matthew and Maritza's. They arrived there at 6.45 for dinner. Little did they know that Matthew had been hatching a very nasty, unbelievable plan. While he was preparing veg, Matthew also popped outside, out to the front of his property, and he placed a large piece of wood, like near a hedge, so to hand, but sort of out of the way, hidden out of sight. He had also swiped some of his mother-in-law's blood pressure medication. And while he was preparing a beautifully homemade soup for their dindins, he crushed up that medication and he put it into the bowls of Paul and his mother, Margaret, obviously with the hope of making them drowsy, pliable. The evening went on. They were drinking wine. They had soup. They had the rest of their meal. Blah, blah, blah. As the meal went on, the elderly couple got a bit tired and decided that they would head home. Margaret had driven over in her silver Mercedes. That was on the drive. So Maritza goes upstairs to see to their son. He's two at the time. She's up there for a while, putting him to bed, settling him down. You know, it takes ages, doesn't it? And then Matthew, he sees his mum and his stepfather out of the front door and he goes to walk them to their car and as they are approaching the vehicle he goes and retrieves this large piece of wood that he has placed like hidden out of sight and from behind he he hits his mother the back of her head and then he does the same to his stepfather and he hits them so hard that they fall 
face first, they just fall. Bearing in mind they've had wine, they've been drugged, so they're really out of it. And this terrible blow to the head, when his mother falls, she actually, it, the fall broke her nose. She just landed straight onto her face. And there were a number of blows to, to Paul, actually. He was in a really weakened state. Also, this guy's had two strokes and is in the early stages of dementia. So he's not, like, you know, top of his game. And he's been drugged. And he's had loads of wine. Like, they don't stand a chance. So he, he beats them round the back of the head and just leaves them out there. Just sort of leaves them out there. I, 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 I can't comprehend. It would seem that he, in his master plan, he had only gone as far as thinking about how he was going to murder them. He was going to drug them and then he was going to beat them round the head with a piece of wood. That was his plan on his, on his own driveway. And then, oh, scratchy head. I don't know what to do now. So he then covered their bodies. He, he dragged them sort of from where they were on the drive onto the lawn, dragged them there and he covered them both in a heavy pool liner. Like, you know, the lining bit of a, of a, of a pool, because they had a pool, because of course you do. And, you know, he put that there. He left them there for two days under a pool liner. That was it. Was he not concerned about, I don't know, I suppose no one's going to come to your property and be like, oh, I'll just have a quick look. Like, you wouldn't be so nosy, but, oh. And also, two days, maybe I thought at that point they would smell, but I think this pool liner was quite heavy. So that might have been containing any smell. He then had two days to come up with a plan. I can't also imagine living my life in my house for two days, you know, probably sort of having to do normal things and whatever. He wasn't working though, so he was just there. That's even worse in a way. So he's just at the house. He was a stay-at-home dad. He'd injured his hand, so he couldn't, he wasn't hairdressing at that point. And he was at home with his two-year-old son. So he was just there at home, living life with his mum and his stepdad out there under a pool cover. Wouldn't you just keep, oh, maybe the house was quite big and he could just not go in the front rooms. I don't know, but you'd look at, oh God. It's almost like, isn't that just sort of, you know, like when you have a chore to do that you can't get round to and you keep, oh God, got to do all that. Oh, it's a bit like that. Like how else could he have been viewing that? I, I don't know. It just doesn't stink of remorse, does it? Like, no, they were just there for two days on the lawn. I'd be worried about animals as well. Imagine animals coming along. Like he, he really had not thought this through. In the end, what he decided to do, he went to a hardware shop and he bought a blue crowbar. He bought rope, chains, locks. He bought, I mean, imagine going in and buying that sort of stuff. It's like, hey, hey what are you doing? They should flag that up. Flag it up. Like this person's come in and bought a murder kit, like just a body disposal kit, basically. Check him out. Oh. So he bought all of that stuff and bricks. He bought bricks. It's very obvious what he's about to do, isn't it? So he then decided that he was going to put their bodies into like a reservoir, into a dam. But when he arrived there, it was all locked up because it's like a proper thing. It's a facility. It wasn't, it's not just open to the public. So he was like, oh. Then he had to go and drive off and think of a new plan. All the while, they're still on the lawn. He eventually came up with the idea that he would hire a trailer that attaches to the car. So he hired one of those. He put their bodies into that. He wrapped them in sheets and then he drove out towards the bush. He got to a place called Marysville and then he found a spot that was sort of like, you know, bushy and there was like overgrowth and stuff. And he he buried, he dug a shallow grave and it really was shallow because it could only fit it was barely big enough to fit them in and it was one on top of each other. So that's how he buried them. But it was dark and he, when he sort of put the soil back on top, because it wasn't really deep enough, it made a mound, like a mound. So it literally, like all of the rest of the soil around was completely flat and undisturbed. He basically made it look like somebody had been buried there. <laughs> like that's what happened. That's what it, it was just like, oh, 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 a grave. Before he had buried their bodies and decided upon his plan, he had driven his mother's Mercedes to a place in Melbourne, a park, Middle Park, and just left the car there. 
his plan was just to say that they'd come round for dinner on Thursday night and that they'd left and he'd waved them off and that that was the last he'd seen of them. So that was as far as his sort of cover-up went. A few days after he had buried their bodies in the in the bush, two park rangers, they, they sort of do have patrols that go around the bush and stuff like that, and they came across this grave, very obvious grave. Although they did think it was some sort of nest at first. Maybe it looked similar to something like they're very knowledgeable about nature aren't they and then you know I think it only took a little prod and a thing and they could see people so they informed the police there is some controversy because the post-mortem autopsy suggested that the couple had died from asphyxiation so they hadn't died from blunt force trauma to the back of the head you know or beating they died from asphyxiation and it was thought that what had happened is because they were so drugged and they had alcohol in their system. Paul was frail, wasn't he? I really fear when I have said lots of names that I've got them wrong. If I've done that in the edit, I'll go back and be like, I mean, such, like, oh God, honestly. Anyhow, so Paul was frail and they believe that in their state and then being knocked unconscious, that when the heavy pool liner was placed over them, that then, you know, they died from asphyxiation. They couldn't breathe. They couldn't get enough oxygen. So that was the sort of said theory. However, the four children, older children, requested that like that be looked further into because they they feel like something else might have happened and that there was more to it and that they had been strangled. And they wanted to know. They wanted to know more. But that didn't happen, unfortunately, for them. As far as the four older children go, they they raised the alarm that their mum and stepdad were missing. They sort of compared notes and realised that no one had been in contact with Margaret for days. They each probably assumed that the others had, and then it sort of came to light that they hadn't. So some of the, some of the children went to her house on the Monday. That's when they raised the alarm. Because when they got there, she was a very particular woman, Margaret, and she liked things done just so. She had r- rules. They had a lot of staff, like gardeners, cleaners. All of the things that were in the house were suspicious and you know what it looked like was for example the wine glasses that they had had Thursday evening before they went for dinner at Matthew's they were in the sink and this was on Monday and they were like not a chance she would never ever have left wine glasses in the sink for like four days something's wrong Also, when they went to her bedroom, they saw that the bed had been turned down, so like ready to get into, and her bedside lamp was still on. And that is how she would have left her bedroom on Thursday, so that when they returned home, she could just slip into bed. So it would suggest that they never got into bed on Thursday night, which, of course, we know that they did not, and they were correct in their assumption. Also, all of their belongings were at home because they hadn't gone on a trip. You know, the police were like, could they have gone away? Could they have visited someone? Could they have gone to a property somewhere else and just got got away for a while? But her glasses were there. Driver's licence was there. Their belongings were there. Lots of things were there that that they just wouldn't have left without. After a couple of days, the case went from a missing persons inquiry to a murder inquiry. This was mainly because no bank stuff had gone on she hadn't used their card she hadn't withdrawn any money and also their mobile phones had not been used at all since Thursday. Golden boy Matthew was a person of interest early doors. He he behaved crazily he when they all got together to discuss the disappearance of their mother all, all of the children he put on a bit of a show and it seemed very odd like he was oh, where's my mama? Where's my mama? Like clutching his head in his hands and sobbing uncontrollably. And it was all a bit like, what is going on? Okay. And it was odd. It was odd behaviour. And they all noticed it. And they all just had a feeling. They all had this gut feeling. And you should always trust that. Damien especially. So Damien contacted the police and he said, hmm, I think you should go and check out Matthew's house. And it was all sort of in the guise of a welfare check and the police did go and they did have a look around. And I I think Matthew's behaviour was 
enough of a red flag for the police to start sort of, you know, poking around. So much so that the police got a warrant for his credit card, debit cards, you know, so that they could see everything that he'd purchased. And lo and behold, clever old boy, not, he had used his own credit card or debit card to purchase crowbar, chains, locks, bricks, all of these things. I mean, it is suspicious. When they had discovered the bodies, they had found a blue, like blue markings around the gravesite. Very odd. I think it was quite hard soil because it basically what they discovered is that he had used his blue crowbar and they matched this to the to the grave to sort of like dig away at the ground a bit. So he had a shovel, but he was also using this blue crowbar and it had left traces of paint. It had left like marks that were, you know, like they were of that crowbar. So wasn't looking good for Matthew, was it? They had enough to arrest Matthew. And when they did, he didn't put up a fight. He didn't kick up a fuss. He was calm. And he said, I didn't do it for the money. I just hated her. I do like to think about the why. I mean, he's basically said why, hated his mum. But he was, he felt alienated from his family. You can see why. Like his four older siblings didn't like him, did they? So he felt separate from them. I think he blamed his mother for that. And it is her fault. It is her fault. If she, if you are going to treat that child like that, you are segregating them from their other siblings. She also lauded money over, manipulated. And I think it just, it's, it's a, it, I'm not condoning what he did, but it's a tragedy because it's a big, horrible manipulation and a um, big old mess when things like that happen with parents and children and narcissism is vile. He felt like he was the runt. He didn't feel respected. So many things were at play at the time. He was also off of work. He might have felt quite depressed. He wasn't able to do his hairdressing. The shop was failing. So many other things in his life were sort of happening as well. He was at home looking after a two-year-old. And things weren't, I think, panning out how he had thought they would. And I do think, really, the crux of it is that he hated his mum. Before trial, he saw a psychiatrist. They noted his low IQ, 83, and they just said he was, he constantly spoke about being separate from his siblings, being apart, being alienated from his family, being manipulated the way he was treated. And that was the factor that had driven him to hate his mum. He mentioned it a lot. In the trial, he showed no remorse for the killings. He was just gutted that he'd been caught, basically. He had confessed and there was also evidence. So there was, you know, the receipts for his credit cards and the things that he bought and the tool marks on the grave. And they also then linked the sheets that the bodies were in back to his house. So, you know, it was all tied up quite nicely in a bow. They also had Maritza. So... She, days before he was arrested, I think she was like, okay, things are going to go down here and I have lied because she originally lied to the police. She just said, oh no, yeah, like they they left. I, I, they just left. But that wasn't true. That was not true. She knew what had happened. She wasn't involved. The police and the investigators determined that she hadn't been involved in the murders. She didn't know that that was going to happen and that she wasn't involved in getting rid of their bodies. So what she had done was pervert the course of justice because she'd gone upstairs. This was in her statement. She gave a statement. She saw a lawyer and she was like, oh my gosh, I have lied to the police and I think he's going to get arrested and we have a two-year-old son. So, you know, they if they both go to prison, what happens there? Like nightmare. I mean, ultimately, love, don't lie to the police. But okay, so she's got herself in this pickle. She sees the lawyer, she gives a statement, and what she says is that she had gone upstairs to deal with Dominic, put him to bed, whatever. She was upstairs for half an hour. They were downstairs finishing off, and then she looked out of a, of a window at the front of the house, and she saw them both on the floor, like on their front. And she that's what she saw first. And then she went downstairs, ran probably t- just to see what, like what. And, and she met Matthew. 
and he was crying he was shaking he was like you know in a, in a state and he and he asked her things like do you hate me because I've done this she watched him move their bodies and put the pool thing over it and so she had this all in her statement she knew that they were there for two days oh my gosh she knew that she lived there so she was going to and from work knowing that they're they're out the front of her house and then they had like quite it sounds like quite normal conversations about it like oh what are you going to do about your mum and and Paul you know and then he he then disposed of their bodies and all she knew about that apparently is that he hired a trailer so he came home with a trailer and then he left and that's all that she knew they presented to the jury that she had nothing to do with it she had witnessed the aftermath and she had just wanted to protect her husband so that's how it was painted. Like, you know, what else could she have done? Oh, go to the police. Oh, no, no. So, and then she was given a two-year suspended sentence. Matthew, on the other hand, he was sentenced to 30 years. 24 of those were with no chance of parole. He is eligible for parole in 2026. Not long. In 2003, a barrister called Hilary Bonney, she wrote a book about the whole case. Let me just read my notes to you. The society is called The Society Murders, The True Story of the Wales King Murders. And it was written without the cooperation from the family, see? Based largely on court evidence and police documents. Okay. And then in 2006, it was adapted for television. It was called, it was a film, television film called The Society Murders for Network 10, written by Greg Hadrick and Kylie Needham. What a case. Is it called matricide? Matricide, when you kill your mother. It's really rare, but it does happen. I did a bit of research about narcissism and the family roles and things like that. And it's kind of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? like a myth, I suppose, that the golden child is the, you know, that they have it made and that it's great for them because it often is like this. It means, so the golden child, like they have to live up to their parent. They have to follow exactly, you know, they, they aren't allowed to be who they are as a person authentically. They have to be what their parent wants them to be. And sometimes that can be things like, you know, doing very well academically, being bright, succeeding, getting a good job. And if they're not, then they fall out of favour. And a golden child can be replaced with another child to be another by, you know, they can lose their spot and then they can be a scapegoat and be treated badly. And also it can mean that a child that is a golden child can be repressed, held back, because their parent will want to take care of them, have full control over them, So they will be stunted in their life. They won't be, they're not free to sort of live their own way, to succeed, to do well. They're sort of held down so that that parent can look after them and take care of them, take care of their golden baby. So that is what it seems like happened with Matthew. And because in a narcissistic family system, the siblings are normally segregated, It does seem in this case, I don't know about the other siblings, how their relationships are with each other, but it definitely feels like Matthew was segregated because he was treated so differently. So to them, it's you can see from their side that they're like they don't like him because he was treated like that and he could do no wrong. And actually, sometimes, you know, he was human and he or, you know, we don't all go around beheading small animals, but he... He had flaws, God, that's quite a big flaw, but he had flaws that his mother could not see. And you can see why they would then feel how they feel about Matthew. You can see that. But from Matthew's side, like he didn't choose that position in the family. He he didn't choose for her to treat him like that. I find the whole thing fascinating, to be honest. I could talk about it for hours, but that is not why we are here. I just wanted to mention it because it was relevant to the case. Anyhow, thank you so much for joining me for today's case. Hope you've all had a wonderful week and that you have a beautiful weekend. It is wildly wet and rainy here and I think it's set to be like that for a little while. 
Thank you so much for joining me today for another episode of St Tonic. I hope you join me next week. No true comes through. Glass, rose, rub pipe of gin. Have a beautiful weekend. I love you. Miss you. Really want to kiss you. See you all next week. Bye.